What we're going to look at today is three particular areas of learning. We're going to just look at how bricks are made, we're going to look at the terminology that we use to describe different types of a brick and we use that on a daily basis. We're going to look at uh, setting out of a basic half brick wall and we're going to look at the sort of standards you're going to have to achieve, the quality of work and how we will measure and mark that so that you can achieve those higher grades as you progress through your programme. So, if you haven't got a pen and paper, just stick me on pause and uh, pop off and go and get one. And it'll be um, useful if you can take notes as you go through. There's a quiz, there's a link to the quiz at the end of this uh, presentation that you'll be able to take note of and then uh, have a go at that. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation. We're going to look at, firstly, how bricks are made and the, the terminology around bricks. You can get handmade bricks, uh, but the vast majority of bricks are machine manufactured by one of uh, two methods. As you'll know, you can get a number of materials uh, that form a brick. You can get a concrete brick, you can get a calcium silicate brick, you can get a raft of them, but 99% of what you'll be laying as a bricklayer will be made of uh, clay. Okay. Um, and formed into the shape of a brick, that rectangular shape that you can see there, and then fired at a really high temperature in order to, to make it uh, solid, compact uh, and robust. There's two types of uh, bricks and the way they're manufactured. And the first one is what's called a pressed process. Okay, and you'll be able to recognise, I'll just put that down over there and just pick this brick up here. Okay, as you can see this brick, it's got an indent in the top. Okay, and uh, the brick is formed into its rectangular shape and then a press compacts down into that form in that indent and making the brick nice, solid, compact, sort of far more impervious to moisture penetration. So that's the first type, which is a pressed brick. We can also see bricks that have holes in them, three holes, 12 holes, six holes. The holes, the number of holes don't really signify anything other than uh, a different type of uh, extrusion process that they've gone through. And that's what they look like, okay? As again, you can see, very similar, it's identical in size and shape to the press brick. Uh, but this one's just got three holes in, okay? And basically it's formed into, again, the rectangular shape, and then it's forced through a machine that has a number of rods through it. The purpose of the holes here are one, it saves on clay and secondly it makes the brick a little bit lighter and uh, so that when we're carrying these about laying them every day uh, they're not quite so heavy. Okay so there's two processes there. There is the press process as you can see and there's the extrusion process but both bricks very much the same. As I said, you'll also see bricks looking very similar to this. The principles of the holes through are exactly the same as those three, those three larger ones. So let's look at brick terminology. Here we have a brick. The long face of the brick, okay, so the main length, as again you can see there, okay, that has a name, and that is the stretcher face, okay? An awful lot of the bricks that you lay will be in what's called stretcher bond. If you look at the walls that you can see from wherever you're, you're sat watching this, probably they're built in stretcher bond, where the vast bulk of the brick work that you can see is the long face of the brick. We then have the shorter face at the end, and that is called the header face. So we've got the stretcher face along the front, we've got the header face which is the end of the brick. Okay, so the stretcher face and the header face. Then we're going to look at the edges of the brick, we don't call them edges, uh, they have a specific name and they're called an aris. And on engineering bricks that aris is really sharp, it's a really strong 90 degree angle and on a handmade brick you might start to see a slightly more rounded aris 
we'll talk more about that when you're with us in September because that can influence your joint size uh, when you're when you're setting out for brickwork. We then have, and these are only on the pressed brick, uh, as you can see, there's an edge around that indent, okay, and that edge is called the margin. Okay, so we have the margin around the edge of the indent, and then we have the indent itself, and a fairly peculiar name, um, but that indent is called a frog. Okay, so these are frog bricks. All of the bricks that you'll lay with us, uh, where they are a pressed brick and have this frog, this indent, uh, you will lay with the frog up, so in, as it's shown in that picture now. Um, most of the bricks that are laid on site that are pressed, there's, there's a preference for them to be laid frog up, or so as you see, that's so. Although if you lay them frog down, it does have a particular benefit uh, in, in that you get little pockets of trapped air up in, uh, up in here, in the frog, uh, and that can help insulation. Okay, so the trapped air is a good insulator, but most of what we'll be doing will be frog up. It makes a more solid, more compact wall. And then if we have a look on the underside, so the underside of the brick, again just there, is called the bed. Okay. So we'll just recap on there. We have the stretcher face, we have the header face, the edges of a brick are called the aris. This part round the indent is called the margin, the indent itself is called the frog, and the bottom of the brick is called the bed. Try to remember those, we'll be using them regularly, daily basis. Let's look at the sizes of bricks. They're a standard size, and we have two dimensions that we refer to. We refer to the actual dimension of a brick, that is specifically how big is that brick without any mortar surrounding it. And then we have the nominal dimensions. We quite often talk about brickwork gauge and length when we include the joint, okay? And as we go through, I'll just explain that a little bit, a little bit more. So, if we look at the stretcher face, the long face, and there is always some flexibility on brick sizes depending on where they were fired, the temperatures they were fired at, you'll, you'll see some variation in bricks. There is a British standard test which we'll carry out in the first few weeks on a, on a batch of bricks and there's a tolerance of plus or minus three millimetres on, on, the, on the length of bricks. But uh, what we try and do is just focus on what they should be and the specific measurement uh, that, that the British standards recommend. So the length of a stretcher face is oops, sorry, is 215 millimetres. That's without a joint, a brick is 215 millimetres long. Most of our joints we work on a basis of 10 millimetres, so the joint between this brick and the next brick would be 10 millimetres. That's both on a, uh, on a horizontal plane and vertically. The end part of a brick, the header, it's not a half of a brick, it's slightly smaller than a half of a brick, it's 102.5 and you'll see that in a couple, a couple of slides. So we've got the stretcher at 215 millimetres, we've got the header face at 102.5 millimetres and the height of a brick, its actual size is 65 millimetres. Okay, so 215 millimetres for the stretcher face, 102.5 for the header face, and 65 millimetres on its height. Okay, so as I said earlier, when we set out brickwork, we assume a 10 millimetre joint. That's both on the bed joint and on this vertical joint which is called the perpendicular joint or the perp joint okay 
sometimes referred to also as the cross joint, but we have the bed joint and the perp joint. That's why I'll be referring to them throughout the rest of this presentation. And as we can see, that would then give us the length of a brick with a joint, the nominal length is 225 millimetres. That's useful when you're working out the length of a wall and how many bricks will fit in it. And you can see we work on a standard gauge with a 65 millimetre brick and a 10 mil joint, 75 millimetres. A half, as I said earlier, isn't an exact half of a brick, okay? If the brick was 215 millimetres long, a half a brick will be 107.5. That wouldn't allow us, if we stuck two halves on top of a brick, that wouldn't allow us to put a, put a joint between them. So it is the half a brick less five millimetres. So a half of a brick is 102.5, but I'll just show an example of that in a minute. We build our wall in, in stretcher bond two halves, so you can see one brick overlaps another half and the brick is on top is evenly spaced, uh, spaced over the two bricks below. And as I said, if we wanted to put a one brick pier up, then we are going to have what we would often refer to as two halves, but bearing in mind, as I said, if you see this is 215 millimetres, what we've actually got is 102.5, a 10 millimetre joint and 102.5. So a half a brick that we refer to is the same dimension as a header. Okay, so the end there is the same as a half. And then going to look at how we can maintain that 75 millimeter gauge, and we can do it in one of two ways. We can use a gauge lap, quite simply, get a bit of wood and mark 75 millimeter increments up it and we can work to that. Sometimes it's useful to have a gauge lap if we have to change the 75 millimeter gauge window size if it doesn't quite work multiples of 75 millimeters we either have a slightly smaller or a slightly bigger joint and they want to be consistent you don't want to have some bigger joints and some smaller joints and so you know we can put on a on a gauge lat a bit of timber the, the marks for the courses, the heights of the courses as we're building up the corners and we can work to those. We can of course also use a tape measure. Again, marked at increments or measuring off the increments of the 75 millimetres. So we've got, as you see there, up to 300 mil. So you've learnt all your timetables before September, try and learn your 75 times tables. It's something we use uh, uh, an awful lot of. And you'll quite often see in plans and specifications that bricklayers work to, they'll refer to the gauge as four courses to 300 millimeters rather than one course to 75 millimeters. Okay, so we've got a gauge, lat, or a tape measure, how we can check our gauge. If we're then looking at maintaining horizontal dimensions, and again, clearly what we're going to be using there is a tape measure. Uh, to mark out the lengths of walls and as you can see there one two three four five six bricks but that's not six times the nominal size of 225 millimeters as you can see on there what we have is in a freestanding wall such as that where there are six bricks there are only five joints okay so we would be working that length out, 6 times 215 millimetres, the 5 times 10 millimetres would give us a wall length of 1 metre 340 millimetres or 1,340 millimetres. When we come to build a wall, First thing we're going to do is set out the length of the wall. We're then going to bed our first brick to gauge at this particular end. And we're then going to bed a brick at the other end. Okay, and rather than gauge that also, from the ground, we're going to use a straight edge 
and a level. And the reason we do this, we gauge this end, and then we would level through from this particular point to the other end on a short freestanding wall is if the ground or the concrete that we're building off the foundation isn't quite level, if it was five millimetres out of level, if we gauged both ends from the ground, then our wall would be built five millimetres out of level following the, the, the gradient of, of the ground, of course. So we can build this end, we level through to the other end, and then we can build our corners and get that first course lined in, making sure we have nice form joints. Okay. What we will do then is build shorter corners. We don't want to be building massive corners. It's far easier to lay bricks to a line than with a level. So we use the level sparingly, build small corners, and then we can line in, making sure we're plumbing and gauging. Notice the gauge at this end is from the top of the first course, not from the ground. This we would gauge up, so we'd have 75, 150, 225, 300. This would have started the top of the first course to take account of, as, as we said, the levelling from one end to the other on that first particular course. And once we've built our corners, of course, we can then line in each course at a time and build our wall. OK, using the line as much as possible. That's where you're going to get your, your efficiency and your scalability uh, by using the line. If you can remember all of that, there is the final question in the quiz is asking you to describe as much of that as, as you can, so you might want to just go back and, and refresh on there. So when we're looking at what you're going to be building and uh, how you're going to be building it, and I'm sure you'll all aspire to, uh, you know, those high grades of distinction is something that uh, you, you will want to achieve. And, uh, you know, we'll support you uh, in as much as we can. Um, There are a number of criteria. There's an awful lot more than here. I'm just going to pick up on a few of them that will give you an idea. So we're going to look at how you briefly set out the work area, the sort of standards we'd look when you're setting out something, how we plumb, what, what plumb means, what we gauge, and ranging level and maintaining bonds. So all of these have a specific criteria, I say, along with a, a raft of others around health and safety, ability to communicate, work effectively, work productively. So when we set out the work area, what we're looking for, that's where the wall would be going. And what we're looking to do is to ensure that we set out so that our workplace is efficient. I don't want to be working, walking all the way over there to get bricks and I don't want to be cramped in too much into a tight space so that I can't work effectively. So as you can see, we stack out bricks, spot board, bricks, spot board again, so that I'm able to move along the length of the wall and, ha and have materials, you know, just easily available to me. And that space uh, is recommended to be between 450 millimetres and 600 millimetres. So that's when you start setting out for your individual work at college. Um, this is how we would expect to see walls set out. So mark your face line down and then calculate your materials and, and stack out and set out accordingly. Okay. And then look at the dimensional setting out. So again, there we are, we've stacked out. I'm going to look at the length of the wall now. This is key, okay? We don't use centimetres in brickwork. We use metres or millimetres. So as you can see, 1.34 uh, metres is 1,340 millimetres. So if I was to measure something that was 900 millimetres, for instance, that would be 900 millimetres or 0 0.9 of a metre. It wouldn't be 90 centimetres. We don't use centimetres. So millimetres or metres are the dimensions we use. And of course, feet and inches of uh, long gone, although no doubt you'll work with people on site who still use them quite commonly. Okay, so when we're looking to set out work, and there is again measurements that we would look to for you to achieve. If you want to achieve a distinction, 
all of your work will be set out to within three millimeters. Okay, so there's about three millimeters of error. So if the wall is going to be 1.9 meters long, you've got three millimeters uh, uh, tolerance, plus or minus. Okay, with six millimeters of merit, 10 millimeters of pass, anything less than that, I'm afraid, will be a referral and you'll be setting it out and building again. As we say, when we're building our wall, that's how we stack out as we use up our materials. What we're looking to do is to ensure that the work area is left clean and tidy. You've maintained the quality of your wall. Everything is returned back to its place, tools looked after, waste materials disposed of correctly. Um, and this is the only criteria uh, that I'm sharing with you that doesn't have a measurement attached to it. Okay, just, uh, we just uh, it'll be a, an observation. If we now look at gauge, plumb and level. So again, there's our wall and there's our gauge lat. Much the same, we can use a gauge lat, we can use uh, a tape measure, either or. Uh, but the tolerance, if you wish to achieve a distinction in your height of your wall, is again plus or minus three millimeters and the joints must be regular thickness so you can't have a 15 millimeter joint somewhere in there and the rest at 10 what we're looking for and then just a tight one on the top of course five mil just to get you back to the gauge at, 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 at the finished wall height what we're looking for is each of these is a regular size and you're within three millimeters again there's a slightly larger tolerance for the merit and a slightly larger toler tolerance for the pass but you'll get the idea that uh, yeah, uh, what you need to achieve for a distinction. We're then looking at plumb, okay, so maintaining that vertical alignment we refer to as plumb, and we check the corners, okay, but they have a name themselves, okay, so a corner, it has a specific name, it's called a coin, Q U O I N, uh, and uh, we will be checking those and there is a standard okay uh, again plus or minus three millimeters if you want to achieve the distinction so that's sticking the uh, yeah placing the level up the wall the spirit level and making sure that the bubble will be in the middle and that there are no gaps okay within uh, between the level and and the wall at the corners we're then going to check for level and much the same, you'll see a common thing, three millimeters comes to the fore. On one or two of the jobs, as you move through to level two, uh, the tolerance drops down to two millimeters, but start off with, this is where we're sitting at, three millimeter mark. Um, and you can see along the length of the wall, we'll, we have a plus or minus three millimeters in order for a distinction to be achieved. And then finally, we place a long straight edge diagonally across the face plane, that's called ranging, okay, where we check in for the flatness of a wall, and you know, we've got the gist by now, plus or minus three millimetres, making sure that wall is not concave or convex, and uh, it's nice and flat. If you keep the corners, the coins, uh, nice and plumb, and you lay straight to a line, then the ranging takes care of itself. So they're the sorts of things that you'll have to achieve in order to uh, reach those, those, those higher grades. This is what we would have been sharing with you had we been at college for some of those days prior to you starting in September. And the final part is we want to make sure that these perp joints stay in alignment. What you don't want to do is to look up a wall and see perp joints on alternate courses moving about. Okay, so we're looking for these perp joints to be nice and plump, vertically aligned on alternate courses, as you can see. Uh, and again, plus or minus three millimeters. 